So today we've got Peter Von Oven. Peter is fairly well known within the workspace industry. He's written 14 books covering VMware Horizon and the surrounding technologies. He's CEO and founder of Droplet Computing, a legacy application technology business. He's going to share with us how he's progressed from warehouseman all the way through to now running his own technology business. He's going to share the highs and the lows, the pivot points, and some tips that you can take away to make a change to your career. I hope you find this useful. Please like, subscribe, and share. And more importantly, comment below. I want to see and hear from you and see what I can do more for you in this area. Let's see what he's going to say. Peter, so thanks for, for joining me today. It's, it's great that you can spare some time to, to share your, your career, your progress, the, the things you've been doing uh, with the wider community. And I think the, the people are going to take a lot of value from this. Um, so as a starting point, can you just give us an intro into who you are, what you do, and then maybe start leading into how your career progressed? Yeah, sure. No, thanks, Carl. Um, so my name is Peter Von Oven. I am currently the founder and CEO of a company called Droplet Computing. Um, Founded about six years ago to address the running any app, anywhere, any device, online, offline conundrum that we all kind of uh, face today, which uh, we'll probably talk about a bit more later on. How did that, how did that career progress then? So how did you go from finishing, not necessarily like every single step of your life, right? We'll be here for, for a long time, but we will. I'm how, did you get, <laughs> how did you get from where you started out in, in your IT career to, to today? How did that pan for you? Yeah. So it has been quite a, a, a long time. Um, so I, I, I kind of studied IT at college, interested in it, did the whole, you know, I, I, got, I got into it from my, my, my dad, really. He um, this is going to show my age now, right? Building ZX80 Sinclair computers came in a post. You build it yourself, right? And that really got my interest. So I did that in college. And then if we go straight into kind of the career side of things, um, although I was working for an IT reseller at the very beginning, I was the warehouse assistant. So my only touching of computers, we talk about IBM PS2s at that time, um, was unloading them from a lorry, sticking them on a the shelf, putting a label on them, and that was kind of it. And it was only until I kind of went, oh, I actually want to see what's inside the box, not, not just the cardboard box, right, the actual machine itself. I start fiddling and then started helping some of the guys configuring to one of the managers going, you kind of know your way around the computer. I'm like, kind of. Um, and it kind of went from there. Um, literally started from... I was a bench engineer, effectively, repairing motherboards, doing warranty work for an IBM reseller. So my first you know, accreditation was an IBM accreditation for repairing PS2 servers. And uh, when I say PS2 now, people automatically think gaming, right? Not, not like personal systems. Um, and then kind of from there, got into the, the engineering bit. I like to kind of explaining stuff to people, if that makes sense. So the natural kind of progression from there was, let's not make technology baffling to people and you know i was always told um and apologies if i'm going to use a swear word you edit it yeah. and you kind of it doesn't need to be complicated right let's explain it how it is and then i kind of naturally progressed into more of a, a pre-sales kind of role because you could understand the technology talk to people and kind of explain it in english straightforward and then just spent probably the rest of my time in kind of pre-sales roles through you know most of the vendors um until you know six years ago I had this idea with a, a co-colleague around you know this idea of where we're at today with, with, with droplet and you know you get to a certain point in your career and you think yes yeah, it's, it's kind of now or never really let's let's try and do this thing for our for ourselves and become our own vendor and and, and see where we go from there so i guess that's the the, the potted history you know from warehouse person to you know, having your kind of own software company today. Yeah, that's a, that's a great like example, right, of, of starting out somewhere and, and progressing your career to where you want it to get to and navigating yeah. the journey yourself. And, just, and just probably the most difficult the right thing attitude. in that. Sorry. And just having the right attitude, right? That just, just gets the, you on that journey. Yeah, no, the, and that's exactly it. It's, you know, I know I wanted to work in IT and I don't kind of have the qualifications or the experience back then when I'm, you know, a, a lot younger. And you know, what I could do was pack boxes, <laughs> right? Um, we've all been in the, you know, had the Saturday jobs in the supermarket, right? Where we, we were doing something like that. 
well, okay, let's get a bit nearer to the IT stuff and, you know, computers come in boxes, work in a warehouse. And then just, it's having that kind of forethought of, go, well, I, I want to do something more than that and demonstrating and getting a sponsor, which, which is how I did it, you know. The, the guy there was a massive sponsor who said, you know, oh, you, you've got an, uh, an aptitude for this. You kind of understand the technology things. Do you fancy going on a course? And then it went from course, course, and then you, you became kind of the lead engineer from an engineering perspective. Every opportunity is, is, is an opportunity. Take it, grasp it, run with it, expand it, and, and try and move forward with it. Yeah, definitely, 100%. I know when I, when I started out, I, I was working as a, a telesales agent in an evening for the right to buy your council house in the UK, right? So oh, right, okay. And I help people buy their council houses from the, from the council. And um, I, then, I then became, uh, that was like my evening job, um, and then during the weekends, I was working as a, a warehouse uh, specialist for basically packing boxes in Morrison's warehouse. Yep. So then I then decided to take a full-time job after college at this, this telesales company. And I didn't want to do telesales, telesales. And what I noticed was they had a, a gold mine um, platform, which basically had a SQL backend that had all their um, data they were buying from left, right, and center. And what they didn't really know was how to navigate that system properly. And mm. as a developer from when I was in college, just doing code, I, I knew how to write SQL queries and all that kind of stuff. And mm. I used that, that educational academia stuff into a real life example and managed to pinpoint areas of the country that they just had never phoned because they right. just didn't know how to use yeah. the system. And at that point they gave me a full-time IT job there running their IT. Again, wasn't, wasn't the, highlight of my career i'll be completely honest it, it was it wasn't great <laughs> start somewhere uh, right yeah exactly but then i went from being the top dog it person because there was nobody else to then being the first line support engineer for um a company called enterprise plc and from there i then worked my career up to where i've got to today and, and that's a video for much later time on, on that kind of stuff but i think the the moral for me is is that if, you, if you've got the right action you want to aim for something then just, just go for it because yeah. it will hold you back, right? And then you'll never get anywhere in life. Uh, uh, no, uh, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's obviously you've got to get those opportunities first. Um, uh, I mean, in between kind of school and the, the, the college elements, I, I, I studied um, H&D electronic engineering. So that's why the kind of the benchy, you know, I, I learned how to solder kind of at a very early age, much to my parents' disgust, who kept thinking the house was on fire. I'm just fixing a motherboard or, or doing something you know um but to, to, to then take that run with it and, and kind of make it your own um and, and coming with ideas and don't be afraid to have ideas even kind of back then it's you know i was you know going into this warehouse and even in the warehouse i was like well actually if you put these boxes here and those boxes there that would make more sense just nothing to do with it but it's kind of like oh okay yeah so it's that logical mindset though that technical people have right it's understanding yeah. the process and looking at it logically and going well actually if we make this minor tweak here and there then it's going to get the outcome that might be better yeah because what they've done in, is in the stockroom they just had everything in chronological number order in parts which you would right but i then went and went well actually this is the networking section because i'm looking for again i'll go show my age a token ring adapter <laughs> and it, it's in the middle of the mice and keyboards because that's where the part number but logically in my head I, if i'm going oh, i need a, a network adapter i'm going to look in the networking section not the keyboard section right yeah because that's where the part numbers are so you know you read rejig all of that and then you can go to like networking keyboards cables whatever it might be and, and go to the right place daft stuff right but <laughs> yeah it makes a big difference in in operational efficiency 100%. it does and for me it does because like i go straight to the networking thing not go but there's a keyboard there's a mouse there's uh, oh there it is <laughs> just throwing the thing left right well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Checking one. stuff out as it <laughs> it's one of those and it's one of these and yeah just logic kind of dictates rather than well it's got to go in you know it goes from one to a thousand and one and we just shove it in where it fits yeah definitely and so it's what, like, what is know, a what does a day in a life of, of, of yourself look like now? What do you do daily? What's the oh, so it's kind of very, very different from where I kind of started. So, you know, everybody thinks all, you know, a CEO of a company is doing this, this grand stuff. And it's like, mm, yeah, there's an element of that. You get to, get to talk to people like you, for example. Um, but it's, uh, you know, very varied. Um, I still get to talk about technology because that's, you know, that's me, basically. And I like doing that. And you still do the talking to the customers and you go on a call. 
and you, you kind of don't really introduce yourself as your, your job role we just go on a call and do techie stuff right you just, it's it's not about that it could be sales related so you know i've kind of learned quite a lot of commercial stuff along the way um you know with support from people who've been doing those kind of roles for for a long time i think the biggest thing for me is to listen to others you know you're not you know as a as a ceo it's not about you it's about everybody else around you and their input so it could be a commercial discussion i've had you know, let's take today you know i've ended the day by well actually won't end the day yet at half past five that's kind of still a few hours left unfortunately you know having a chat with with with, with you who've known for i can't remember quite a while now yeah it's about eight seven eight years roughly yeah it's, it's been a while um so, so having this conversation with, with yourself um I've had some commercial discussions with a customer today around you know, trying to sort out a deal and put financing in place and how we look at one, two, three year software deals, et cetera, to onboarding a partner, to having a discussion with our uh, distributor uh, around you know, up and coming products, roadmap discussions with the technical team, which is a call I had uh, previously around strategy and di direction of the company. Later on, after I've done all the kids stuff, I've gotten the important stuff, I am almost at the end of writing book number 14. So it's kind of an element of work and an element of family and then an element of, I don't know, madness in writing a book. But Is, that, is the next one another improvement, uh, a bolt onto the horizon stuff again? <laughs> yep um it is uh it's gonna be a shameless plug now isn't it yeah why not <laughs> why not um it's gonna be the app volumes 4.x book um following on from my 2.x book obviously vmware are great at launching lots of uh software they usually tend to i should know this by now having spent almost five years working at vmware previously that's when a product release is coming, don't write a book when the product's going to change mid book. <laughs> yeah. And particularly when you go from a 2.x release to a 4.x release and you go, all of those screenshots, yeah, they've all changed color. And you know, and I know when you're reading a book, if the screenshot doesn't match, <laughs> you're massive. we're that picky, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I well, am. So. Yeah, I think like, I remember reading one of the original books, which was the, the I think it was a Horizon Intro to I think it was one of the original ones that came out. It was like maybe 300 pages-ish, 400 pages in total. Uh, yeah, so so the record is, and, and I can't take this just for myself, it's with my uh, co-author, another fellow IT uh, colleague you know well as well, Barry Coons. Yeah. Um, our original Horizon book was circa 800 pages. Yeah. And that wasn't all of it. The publisher actually said, we can't fit that much paper in the book. It's going to be like, <laughs> like this big. Um, and about three or four chapters actually went online. So if you'd printed it all out, it would have been over a thousand pages. Yeah, I've got Barry on in a, in a few weeks as well. So he's going to be doing a session on this. So it'll be interesting to see his thoughts on content creation for these books, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll say don't do it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's interesting. That, that, yeah, that's the next one that comes along. But that's, you know... I like the community stuff and you, know, you I know you are big in the community as well. And I think that's what helps us all grow and learn. It's becoming part of that community, giving back, but also learning as well, which is, you know, we do books, we do blogs, we, 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 we talk to people and it's, 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 you know, I think for anybody starting out is, you know, get involved in a community, get to know people, um, get to know what they do, how they do it, because they become a great source of information. We're, we're learning all the time. Um, you know, even even writing a book now is, you know, I can just ping somebody at VMware, ping somebody on one of the Slack channels and go, I'm stuck. They often go, well, hold on a minute, you wrote the book. I went, yeah, I know, but I'm still stuck. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah community is big, I think, is, is, is the key there. Yeah, and I was speaking to, um, to, to Neil McLaughlin the other night on community, and we were saying that community is great for reciprocal knowledge, right? So learning things on their own oh, experiences. Yeah. But it's, it's also great from a networking perspective to look at what your next opportunity might look like. But then also in yeah. current times where people are being made redundant, having that wide community to go and say, do you know there's any jobs going anywhere? It's quite powerful as well. Yeah, no, no you're absolutely right. And that's, that's a good point, especially, you know, times as they are right now is... Yeah, it's great for the knowledge and how do I do this and where do I click there? But also you build that kind of 
trust, friendship uh, with with people and, and kind of look out for each other. And it's a big community, um, but you never know where that next opportunity is coming from or, you know, you might have something at CDW, you go, oh, well, I'm going to ask the people in the community. There's a few people out there that might be relevant, looking for a new challenge, looking to progress their career, et cetera, whatever that might be. And, you know, and I would do the same rather than, you know, yeah, job agencies are good to a point, but you know, personal knowledge of, of people and recommendations personally, it, it far outweighs that is so much more powerful. Yeah, I think it's going back to what we're discussing with the five stars on Amazon again, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was reading an article as well earlier on um, how the CEO of IBM a few years back removed the requirement of having a degree for okay. diversity and inclusion purposes. Because if you wanted to work at IBM previously, you needed to have a degree as a minimum entry level. And obviously yeah. that's very inclusive, right? Because not everybody has access to that kind of education or even no. to that kind of academia world. No, it's right. I mean, I, I didn't, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I did H&D at college. I, I do have a degree, but it's completely not related to IT. It's from a, a, a pastor job. So um, I have a degree in uh, criminology, uh, policing studies. So you can have a guess at what that career may or may not have been. <laughs> um, slight change to IT. Um, but it's having that kind of experience and you shouldn't limit, you know, I've, I've said to my, my kids, you know, I've got a 13 year old and 11 year old is while, you, you know, academic academia is important, you know, and, and going through A levels and going degree, if that's the path you want to choose. But I think if you, you know, an apprenticeship or something similar, where you're going to learn on the job and get real hand experience, I think in the future will far outweigh somebody turning up with a paper, paper degree. Yeah. And it and it almost was used to be like in the IT world, you know, everybody had an MCSE, right? <laughs> did you have one? Of course you did. Yeah, everyone did. Everyone did. Uh, I stopped at 2008, I think, in messaging because Exchange just did my head in. So that was the end of that. And I used to actually, rightly or wrongly, but interviewing people, you could tell who had really done it and who hadn't by, you know, if, if you were going to... We're going to get technical. If you were going to make a domain controller, you'd go to a command prompt and go DC promo, right? Yep. That's the wrong way to do it. You're supposed to go start, manage my server, do this, add role. Who does that? Yeah. <laughs> the textbook guys, the guys in the real world just go DC promo. Silly, but it's, the, it's that having that, having that knowledge of, you know, real life experience, I think is. So we'll skip the finish line one because most people's answer is I don't have one. Um, a bit mine well, is retire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, retire. Make some money, retire. Not unless you sit on a beach, spend more. T- well, hopefully, while the kids are still young, spend more time with them and just, you know, chill out. You know, that's 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 my finish line. You know, get droplet to a point where I can exit, pocket some cash. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but. I'm not going to stop because that's not me. I'll still write. But then, you know, in my spare time, uh, I think about a year, 18 months ago, maybe even two years, I can't remember, I, I became a STEM ambassador. Okay. I joined the STEM program to go out and help the next generation. And how, how was um, that? Was it good? I, I love it. I've, I've just got my uh, um, award badge thing. That's uh, I did 50 hours last year, even given the, was it this year? Might be this year now. Uh, yeah, 2019, 2020. 50 hours of voluntary work going into schools and talking like we are now about technology, how I got started, pitfalls, what you need, what you don't need. Um, done interview courses, CV writing courses, judging competitions, building Lego Mindstorms. You know, the, the stuff is awesome. And you know, STEM is an awesome thing as well. I, I really encourage people to get involved with it. But also you learn a huge amount of stuff back from some of these kids. Yeah. And, you know, I use the word kids. Some of them have been kind of teenagers, you know, uh, A-level type students. And you think, if I had a job, I'd employ this person tomorrow. They've got some real good, you know, thought leadership around new ideas, around how things should go. And you just think, oh, God, I'm a bit old and jaded, really, aren't I? I <laughs> These guys have got some great ideas and they and actually stuff for me to go back into into my business and think, well, actually, this this some better ways of doing this. Yeah. Um, but the STEM thing, yeah, no, it's absolutely, absolutely awesome. Yeah, I know that in CW we sponsor um STEMettes. So same program, but for women in technology ultimately. 
to bringing yeah. girls and youth in as well at the same time. That's that's pretty that's good. what that's exactly what got me started. So I've got two girls, um, and they were doing code club at their primary school, but the teachers, because the curriculum kept changing, were struggling. And obviously, you know, you stand in the school playground and get chats and go, oh, you work in IT. And I think, I'm oh, not fixing the printer. Please, no printers. <laughs> um, the, my nemesis printers. Oh, hate no one should be printing anyway, right? We should all be going green. Exactly. Well said. You should never print. Um, and yeah, it was just kind of, oh, there's a whole class of kind of, well, the girls don't really get the same as the boys. Not Well, how is that so? I've got two girls who are into coding. Um so let me come in and, and actually the interesting parts out of a class of, I think we took about like 20 odd people, 80% were girls, which I thought was awesome. A um, few boys, and, uh, but the girls and the girls were really into it. Um, and that, that was brilliant. And it, you know, we've, we've continued that. And then, you know, I got involved in the whole, whole STEM thing and, and, you know, applied to be a, uh, an ambassador and uh, go around, you know, schools all around the southwest of england um almost like taking lessons and, and doing all this interaction with them just to, to build up uh you know the, the skills because we're kind of lacking in in some of the technology stuff i mean certainly from me uh in in the company that i'm in now when we look for skills a lot of those skills are kind of thin on the ground here in the uk and you think why why is that where are all the skills let's rather than go and you know yes there's skills out there we can go get let's let's build them here you know let's do that made in britain thing again um and give the kids something back as well get them actually doing something meaningful rather than just you know as i said to our girls like it's great you download a game within seconds and you play it not like you know i had to put a tape in and wait half an hour it may or may not load you know you, you, it's just there right why don't you write your own there's a challenge and yeah. they're like oh yeah Obviously, you got into industry because you, you you like technology and playing with 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 tech and motherboards and the original days and things. But more importantly, now, if you were looking at growing up to an extent, right? So if you're looking at your next role or things like that, what what would that be? So like, obviously, you're running your own business now, and then you manage to successfully um, sell on Droplet. What would what would be the the next step for you other than retirement? Other than retirement, um, I don't know. People kind of say, "Wouldn't you do another startup?" I was like, "Well, potentially," but it's kind of spotting that niche where you know you don't want to be a also ran and say, "Well, I'm just going to do what others do because that's you know already been done." So if you could come up with an an idea, and I haven't come up with it yet, although I've, I've spoken to a few people who have got some ideas who have kind of said, "Oh, we're looking at doing this," um, and a lot of that's been around kind of obviously cloud um some of the automation pieces around that and you think yeah that's there's some interesting stuff going on there so that that could be a another interest um the one thing i, I kind of it's not a regret as such but you kind of almost get a little bit pigeonholed as you're the euc guy right yeah you probably know it that's how you know me right um and like, if you want to kind of broaden outside of that and do some cloud or some automation or some Kubernetes or stuff like that, I go, well, you're the EEC guy. That's not your stuff. And to maybe learn a whole new technology, I'd, I'd love to go back to programming a little bit. Uh, I never really did it seriously. Um, and I see our developers here and go, that's, that's quite cool. I wish I could like make that do that. Um, I could probably just about do 10 print hello and 20 go to 10 and make it go down the screen on a good old basic <laughs> yeah but that's that's where i started right sinclair basic bbc basic you know once a week in school the trolley would come around and you'd play on the computer not play educational clearly <laughs> um and you think oh, maybe a, a bit of a change in direction and, and do some of that coding stuff um or look out for another opportunity retire um but that's kind of you know that's the, the things that go through your head as what what's next um stay here stay a droplet for as long as it's successful um but also possibly you know if you if you don't work kind of full-time and you do some of these new ideas is to maybe do a bit more of the kind of the, the stem type stuff a bit more of the kind of the voluntary um stuff because you've you've, you've kind of done 
a lot of what you wanted to do and then let's go and talk about that and give back yeah and not become a teacher but just to become that person who's can give you that kind of advice and guidance having been in the industry for you know, quite some time um and you know already doing it but maybe do it on, on a bit longer thing and kind of help those schools that you know struggle a bit with i you know it kit um come up with ways of trying to get them enabled as it were without having to spend a bucket load of cash on you know a whole set of laptops or or, or whatever is you know their their business is teaching the kids right they're not worried about what how do i do this and it's going and doing that and kind of yeah, you get kind of a bit of a buzz out of out of, out of helping people. Uh, Perfect. What would you say your most memorable moment of your career is to date? Oh, good question. Um, I think probably publishing my first book. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, if we go back and have that education conversation, I hated English at school with a passion, absolutely hated it. And I think I actually spent a lot of the lessons in the corridor um, because I couldn't behave myself and it just didn't interest me. Um, what am I going to do with English? I, I want to be techie. And then to actually kind of try and do this, you know, write a book. You know, okay, it's not a novel, right? I'm not, I'm not a Ken Follett or a Lee Child or anybody like that. Um, but to take, you know, you know, what you do in pre-sales is you stand up, you whiteboard, you tell a story about how you're going to solve a customer's technical challenge, but you put it in stuff that they understand. Yeah. And that's what writing a book was. It's just and, and this was the advice I gave to a couple of the other guys because I was trying, when I was at VMware, a couple of other guys went, oh, we, we've been approached to write a book. Should I? And I was like, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll help you. And one of the guys, um, you'll know very well, um, who's, who's good at standing up and waving his arms around a lot um, in the cloud. I said, what you do there, standing up there, waving your arms about, talking, just write it down. That's your book. Because you're engaging people, people are engaged with you because you, you're telling a good. Write it down, yeah, and that's dictate, kind of dictate, dictate it, and then and then get it to change it, and then just go and edit it. Yeah, because I said that, and I said I'll, I'll just film myself, and then I filmed myself, and went, I'm not watching that back. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, a, what an idiot! Look at him. Um, and I think that, that yeah, to, to go back to, to to my point is you know. Again, it was a, a weakness, but it managed to actually, you know, put something together. But you can't do it on your own. I had a kind of a publisher behind me for for, for a lot of those books. But to then to, to see, you know, this book arrive with, you know, that many pages and read it, and it's got your name on the front. You think, wow, I did that. How cool is that? So I think that's probably one of the kind of biggest things for me. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I can say that I have zero intentions to write any books. Yeah, I would recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Problem is, I did say I would stop at 10, but it becomes perversely addictive. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard. I think I think my my challenge would be I'd get, I'm an all or nothing kind of person, right? So it's, I'd end up then, just, I'd just be, become my wife. I'd have to then just be writing and writing and writing. And, and as I'm told over and over again internally by a few people in, in CW, my English writing skills is not the best. I write it as I would say it which is, in my Thank opinion, the best way, um, but it's not the right way for, for true English language. But then that's <laughs> what the proofreaders are for, because, you know, I, I always say English was my second language, techie is my first. I'll, I'll write it how I say it. Um, and whether that's actually an English word in the English dictionary, I don't care. <laughs> it's in my <laughs> dictionary. Um, and, you know, the proofreaders do an amazing job and they put it into, oh, yeah, that's the word I meant. Um, and without them, I couldn't kind of kind of do it. Um, and, and that's the thing. You can't do these things on your own. Um, and, you know, one piece of advice is don't try and do it on your own. There are people that have all of those skill sets. You may have the technical knowledge, absolutely no doubt, because that's what you do for a living. These guys are proofreaders. These guys are publishers. These guys are the graphics guys for, for making it look all, um, you know, tarted up and nice and colourful, etc. Um, take their skills and experience and, and build the team is what I would say. You know, learn from others. So what would you say, moving on from the most memorable moment, what is the, the biggest mistake you made and the lesson you learned from it? Um, 
So I probably would think, and you know, you'll, you'll disagree because you're in that position. Is, is moving from a vendor to a partner to a reseller, and then being too far removed from the technology coalface because now you're just flogging other people's stuff. And this is going back a while ago. It's not, you know, resellers now aren't just resellers, right? You know, you've got the whole consultancy, the the SMEs in there who really know what they're what they're doing. But this is going back a, a while and leaving a big vendor um, to be lured away you know, financially, let's be honest, to go and work for a reseller and kind of them kind of almost trading on the fact of oh, we've got one of Compaq's old pre-sales managers heading up our technical team and thinking you're just kind of trading off my name because I'm not doing anything that I want to be doing, basically. Um I admit, you know, I'm having to almost second, third hand talk about the technology because I can't phone up a product manager in Houston and go, what's coming next? Can you let me have this or access to a lab in Richmond that we used to have or do all this kind of thing? You, you, and I think for me, that was like, yeah, that was the absolutely the wrong move. I removed myself too far away from what I enjoyed. Yeah, and, I think that's, and then trying to get back into the vendors again. Yeah, that's one of the things that I think we're discussing with Al and with, with Neil and Simon. And it was the do something that you want to do, not yeah. do something that you think you want to do purely for the money, because the money will come at some point if it's something you enjoy doing. Because as soon as you don't enjoy doing it, you're going to leave anyway. You, you write, the writing's on the wall already. If you, if you don't enjoy it, you're not committed, you're not going to go that extra mile, you're not going to further yourself yeah. because you've, you've kind of switched off, checked out, whatever. Um, so I think that for me was the, the the biggest mistake. And, you know, once I kind of identified that, luckily it wasn't for long, um, then I was straight back into a vendor yeah. and have always then been with a vendor. Yeah, or on um, your own, as the case may be. And uh, being a vendor on my, that's an entirely different story. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but then having said that, you kind of think about, all of the vendors you've worked for and the reasons why they do things. And you think about, it's probably the same at CDW, you know, it's a big organization. There's a lot of process, right? And you think, oh, for God's sake, all this red tape, all this process. And you think, and I thought it naively, well, I've got my own company. We're not having any of this process rubbish or blah, blah, blah. I know why you need it now. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely there for a reason. If you're planning, you're strategizing, you're putting your numbers on the wall, all that kind of stuff, it's it, without it's a, those kind of processes, you're not going to get it right. And at some point you're going to go in the red. It, you're not. You're just kind of going to be you know, firing all over the place. You, you need, you know, your strategy nailed down, where you're going, where you are today, how you plan on getting there, you know, roadmap planning, financial planning, um, policies for this, policies for that, you know, GDPR stuff. <laughs> yeah. You need all of that stuff. Um, and as dull as it is, it's absolutely required. And, you know, you always, always you moan when you're in corporate land, oh, the expenses policy, it's fired that back because I've not done that right. And they're just being annoying, not paying my expenses. And then when you see it from the other side, it's like, well, it's got to go to the accountants. It's got to go to VAT. It's got to go to HMRC. You can see the reason why it got fired back now. Yeah. <laughs> If you, if you were someone starting out in the industry today, what would be your, your top three tips? If I was what, sorry? Starting out in the industry again, what would be your top three tips? Oh, research. You know, make sure, you know, you, you're looking at what you want to do um, and go and do some kind of background information. You know, well, it's, it, there's loads of stuff online, right? We've talked about community. Have a look, see what people are saying and kind of see, is that what you expected it to be? Because some people I've seen come into the industry thinking it's, you know, might be blinded by pound signs. And then they get into the industry and think, mm, it's not quite what I thought it might be. Um, it's called almost like a try before you buy. So I would say definitely do your research about the roles. See what's on offer. Find some people to talk to. Um, what else? So that's probably got a few tips all in one, really. Um, cool. So moving on to like industry then. Um, yeah. So obviously the industry's changed a lot. I mean, we won't go into, into that in too much detail, but picking up on the current timeframes of the pandemic and the things that are happening, how, how have you seen it from your conversations with customers and even running a, a new startup business? How has it impacted you and how has it impacted your customers? And 
positively or negatively because some people have seen positives from this to a good to agree as well yeah we've, we've probably seen a mixture to be honest um so a lot of the work we were doing um was nhs based so healthcare etc um obviously their focus changed somewhat um at the beginning of this year and so quite rightly so budgets were put into that so some of our deals kind of went away for, for the time being um but on the flip side you've got others wanting to deploy a, a work from home strategy like now um we haven't got the money for vdi because although we could do it quickly we need to buy servers we need to buy storage we need to buy location we don't know how it works because we've never done it before um although i could probably supply a book that would help you on that um <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's vmware um how do we get these people kind of back productive um and that's where you know i said earlier on you know, literally sending out usb sticks with containers on for people people to run so we we saw that as a a, a real positive but then you get to the um the whole ethos around the work from home piece which is some people have been okay others have not adapted well me personally it really wasn't much different to, to how i've worked before and probably for you as well because i know you, you you kind of work remotely as well you're not in london every single day of the week no. luckily <laughs> um and just kind of relearning that work thing as i said for me it's you know i get up i cross the hallway i go into the study and and, and, and i do my calls and maybe i'll go out to meetings maybe i won't um or won't in this case and it's others are adapting to that kind of practice because we always you know, years ago people go oh you work from home air quotes you know actually <laughs> you're watching jeremy kyle or bargain hunt or whatever else on not that i know that's what's on in the mornings apparently it's not anymore so i'm okay in saying that um and now people are kind of thrust into that you, you've got no choice right and how do you use it to, to to help you continue working you know most people have got laptops but what if you haven't you know, we've, we've seen kind of the stories on the news around, you know, the kids having to do their schoolwork whilst mum's trying to do work and dad's trying to work all on one or two devices. And it's Imagine been a real... Imagine compounding that, right, with maybe a one or two bedroom apartment in the centre of London where you've not got a lot of square footage anyway and you've got two kids and two adults in that property in lockdown for an extended period of time. Right? So it's yeah. not a working environment you want to stay in and you might not have... The luxury that, that me and you have probably got around a proper office space with a desk and monitors and nice room to move around and lighting and all that kind of stuff to actually just being on a bed or on a dressing table or on the sofa working on your knee. And my, my worry to some of this stuff is, is outside of the mental well-being of not being able to socialize yeah. and be with people and all the things that come with that is also the, the, the health and safety aspects of it. So an employer has a duty of care to provide a desk that's at a reasonable height and chairs that can yep. adapt to you and ergonomic this and things like that. You don't get that in this situation and you're now working from home in the best way you can, but what's the impact it's had on your health in that process? So is your back now in pieces? Is you, are you getting RSI or, or compounding that potential RSI you've already got and all those kind of things without really yeah. needing to? And that's, that's another worry for me in this current situation it where people just want to go fully work from home now and shut offices down without really thinking about maybe the consequences that come with yeah. that. Yeah, and that, that's a really good point because as somebody who has worked from home for a long time, I, I do now suffer from two um, bulging discs in my neck. And when I've been to the physio and been to the hospital, they went, that's because you're sitting with your neck like that all day long. That's it, bad posture, that's caused that. Before the pandemic, I was about to undergo surgery for like RSI type, you know, uh, locking fingers and things. Obviously, that can't happen. Kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, some, something along those lines. They call it like trigger finger where your fingers lock yeah. and you, you, you have to like click them back. I don't want to turn this into a medical interview. <laughs> in my <head. laughs> but, um, you know, those purely were consequences of probably me working from home a lot of the time. And now people are just about to start that journey if you like of working from home and you're right employers need to make people aware of this um and maybe help you know if, if you're going to save real estate like in the city of london and, and not have your uh, big offices and save all that money then give people an allowance to have the right chair 
to have the right desk. You know, I'm, I'm just about to, I just got rid of my old desk. I'm buying a, um, a, a I'm going to go for the standing up desk. Um, see how that goes. I think it, it can't go any worse than kind of sat like this. <laughs> yeah. But um, it, it's, uh, and employers, you know, should reinvest because you're reinvesting in your workforce, right? Because you do that for a year because you're now working from home and then you're off for six weeks because you just had back surgery. That's not yeah. great for the business, but it's really not great for you who's now got to recover. And all because maybe your employer could have, you know, spent 200 quid on a chair for you or 200 quid on a desk that raises up, which, you know, in the grand scheme of things, isn't a huge amount of money based on the gains that you're going to get. You, you, the employee is going to feel better. They're going to be more productive. They're not going to be off sick. And, you know, I think there is a lot of onus now or should be, shall I say, on employers to, to make that happen. I know certainly you know, we would, and I'm sure you guys would as well, but it's, yeah, we it's going to well, be a change. Packages and various things in CDW, so we're, we're pretty well equipped, but my, my worry on this is the longer term and yes, peak two, peak three, return to work, full stop, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but hey, it'll, it'll be whatever it'll be, and we'll, we'll I'm sure everyone will weather the storm and, and come out of it hopefully as, as unscathed as we can. So, what um, what area of technology do you think organisations are undervaluing and not not really taking seriously? Well, I think they've kind of realised that, and I think it's some of the the end user technology. They've now realised that they've underinvested in providing you with the technology that you need to do your role. Uh, not you personally, but because yeah. you've probably got a lot of technology, but you know, the average kind of, of, of worker, uh, you know, who, who doesn't need to invest in technology is not their interest. So they're not going to go and buy the latest iPad or Mac or whatever, yeah. but now are expected to go home and do that and employers expecting it and having the services in place to deliver that, you know, we probably see, and, and, and I don't have figures to hand, but you know, Amazon workspaces, WVD, you know, WVDs come out of the blocks and just gone, gone poof, upwards because you know, it's desktop in the cloud. I can access it from my device. But have you got a device? Have you got a device that's capable of connecting and, 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 and running that kind of experience? Um, but it's only now because people have kind of had their arms twisted. And I'd say people as in employers, uh, IT departments, had their arms twisted up behind their backs to have to do this stuff when they could have done it before. And provided that, you know, technology for you know, people to do business with. Yeah, I think I think things are gonna. I'm hoping that people do invest in that area. Right, it's a very passionate area for both of us. It's where we've come from and what we've we've done a lot of in the past, and, mm. and still do to a degree. And I think I think to see that part of the industry get some recognition, which it has had, is is, is great news. And I know I was talking to a customer the other day, and um, and he's an IT director, and for the first time he actually went into a board meeting and actually got a round of applause. Wow. Because for him and the organization that he works for, that, that they've been able to, to not furlough anybody. They've been able to run as they were running in uh, the office because they had the right technologies and processes and things in place and the training and adoption before all this, that when this actually did happen, it was very minimal impacting for them. And if anything, yeah. he's probably saving the money on the real estate and services they consume and, and bills that they have in offices right um, yeah and they're still getting the productivity out of people that they were they were seeing previously um, that's the thing isn't it it's not shock tactics because you know human nature is you know we, we like to we don't like change do we or massive change it's always been you know that thing whereas you know it's now suddenly like right don't come into the office and use your desktop go home and use something else and people are like i don't know what to do it's like rabbit in the headlights moment right Whereas if a, an organization had invested in that and kind of brought that technology in, it would be like, okay, I work from home today, you know, and having that um, option of, you know, just a one day work from home policy where, you know, on a Friday or whatever, don't come into the office and we'll slowly give you what you need in, in terms of um, you know, maybe not kit, but kind of the, the, the access to the organization so that you can do your job remotely. Um, it's almost like the old DR stuff. You know, what, what happens if you what happens if you can't get into London because there's been a fire, there's a flood, there's some kind of emergency where people can't get to the office. And I think we last saw this kind of around 
um was it the 2012 london olympics when mm. kind of people started panic buying vdi because they didn't think people would be able to Commute. get into town to actually work right so we're going to have to look at um some kind of remote working um and you would have thought from there that was eight years ago i mean eight years ago already the olympics that people think well okay something could happen again and we need to look at this kind of remote you know technology the ability to give people you know an experience at home on on whatever they've got i mean most people smart tellies you know they've got browsers on them you could do other, cars have browsers on the dashboard you can get your email on an app on the dashboard of your car that's great if you've got those kind of things but it, it's the companies making sure that people have that stuff in the first place and just the get them in the mindset as well it's not just having the physical stuff it's getting in the mindset of you know you can go home you can work do it one day a week if you can't come into the office because you know train strikes or weather or you know, child off school because they're ill or whatever that's fine just let us know open up your laptop open up your ipad open up your phone there's the company experience you know, off, off you go um and it's only when there's a you know an event shall we say that we get back to that again yeah and it's unfortunate it takes something to happen for people to to put real business continuity and dr plans in place like right? business continuity is the primary thing that we're talking about at this moment in time and i, I remember writing a blog on business continuity uh, and i'll put a, a card to it somewhere up here and it was basically um the, the concept for me is that people always have like a dr and business continuity so i said oh we only need 30 percent of our workforce to function how yeah, true really? is that in this current situation so why don't you reduce them by 30 <laughs> percent? yeah mm. and you know having you used to see these things and i don't know if they still exist because I'm, I'm not really in the dr field you used to have rooms and rooms of pcs all set up ready to go in a different location where instead of going that way to the office you go that way um yeah. I don't know if those things still exist. But... I remember working with a council um, who, in, in the event of a business continuity um, uh, event where they couldn't get into their primary building, um, they would have a, a, a coach outside the primary <laughs> building that would pick up the people that went to the primary building and take them to the secondary building to function. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> That's one yeah. way of doing it, I suppose. And how, uh, how much is that costing? And, and you know, people have got all of this kit sat on a desk doing nothing, essentially. And then what happens when there is an event? The stuff doesn't work. <laughs> no one tests it really, do they? Nobody tested it. Because it, it always I used to um, kind of laugh about this. It's like, how often do you test your fire alarm? They go, oh, Monday, every week, 10 o'clock. Cool. <laughs> when do you test your DR on your failover? Uh, don't know. <laughs> is that not equally as important? Obviously, getting people out of the building when it's on fire is very important, right? I get that. But when they're out of the building... You know, let's be honest, businesses still have to function. How, how are you going to deal with that? Yeah. Well, you know, it might not happen. It's like fire might not happen, but you still test the fire alarm every Monday at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Let's do some lightning questions, some quick random. Uh, let's, see, let's see what we can come up with here. So last technology purchased. Um, iPad Pro and the new smart keyboard thingy. I don't know what it's called. The hingy one that makes it look like a laptop. Okay. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Who's your biggest inspiration? Oh, go blimey. Um, yeah, probably a cliche one by saying like my dad, who kind of you know got me into this in the first place and is still there now, kind of providing kind of the background support and advice as that you know having been there and 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 done it. Uh, what does work life balance mean to you? A lot when you can make it balance. What do you want to do when you finish school? Finish school. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to get out of there. <laughs> what was, what's your favourite book? Favourite book? You can't say your own. Oh, yeah. 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 Learning Horizons. Uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I couldn't. There's too many of them. Probably the one that I go back to is um, Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett. And there's a whole trilogy. And actually, he's just released... Uh, uh, a prequel to one of those uh, favorite song ah oh, there's so many so i've gone back to some that because of the death of eddie van halen so the jump stuff's come out yeah 
because I saw them in concert twice in the 90s. So I don't say that's my favourite, but that's that's the one that's kind of the, the favourite at the moment. Um, Everlong by Foo Fighters is another one that's up there. Um, yeah, that, cool. that, that, that kind of... Fill in, fill in the blank. The new normal is? <sighs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Must watch TV show. <sighs> See, I don't watch much TV. Um, must watch TV show. Do you know what? It probably goes back to, I'm not answering this properly, am I? But <laughs> I've got this real thing of um, some of the channels have been showing some really old stuff. So yesterday on Forces TV, they showed the first ever series or episode of Chips. Remember that? California yeah. Highway Patrol, Punter. So I could probably answer that like old, old, old episode of The Bill. <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, Neil, Neil said yesterday, casualty, so. Oh, I'm just not far off then, was I? It's, it's kind of the old... Uh, the one thing my wife would probably say that I, I watch that really, really annoys her is Bullseye, <laughs> as in the Jim Bowen darts yeah. quiz. Oh, because, special prize. <laughs> look what you could have won. BFH, bus fair home, and <laughs> you've won a speedball. <laughs> Do you know what the real reason for that is? Um and this was probably goes back to the inspiration question. It's my grandfather. It reminds me of him on a Sunday tea time. That's, you know, that's, that's it. You know, and another big inspiration in my life. My, my, my grandfather. Yeah. Definitely. God rest his soul. And favorite junk food. Favorite junk food, sausage rolls. Oh yes. Good old pasta or sausage roll. Big, big chunky, either a, a, a Greg's one or uh, yeah, anything that's got a sausage and a roll involved, basically. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I think on that last question, I think we could probably call it a wrap there. So again, thank you. Thank you for spending the last hour or so with me. It's been fantastic. And uh, awesome. yeah, we'll do something again in the future, hopefully.